All right, welcome back to the second half of topic 7.4. We're picking up today with the Stalin Revolution. All right, so first we're taking a look at the five-year plans and the collectivization of agriculture. So that's something you really got to focus on is what happens when Stalin takes over and initiates his series of five-year plans. Joseph Stalin was the son of a poor shoemaker. And he had very humble origins, but he was a very skilled administrator, and he rose to become the leader of the Communist Party. Part of how he was able to do so was, given his background, he could relate to the people. Stalin set about the task of industrializing the Soviet Union in such a way as to increase the power of the Communist Party domestically and increase the power of the Soviet Union in relation to other countries. Beginning in October of 1928, Stalin devised a series of five-year plans, and these were designed to achieve ambitious goals by instituting centralized state control over the economy. Under the five-year plans, the Soviet Union achieved, achieved rapid industrialization accompanied by the kind of environmental changes that the U.S. and Canada experienced during their period of industrialization several decades earlier. And this kind of environmental change that took place in the U.S. and Canada took place over decades. The Soviet Union does this in within five and ten years. The Soviet Union squeezed the peasantry to pay for the massive investments required by the five-year plans. And they were also forced to provide the labor and food supplies that the new industrial workers required. So how the Soviet Union did this was to consolidate small farms into vast collectives. And these collectives were expected to supply the government with a fixed amount of food and distribute what was left among the members. And you can immediately see how this is going to create a problem. Collectivization was an attempt to organize the peasants into an industrial way of life and to bring them and food supplies firmly under the control of the government. This was accomplished, guys. The process of collectivization was accomplished by the violent suppression of the better off peasants who were referred to as the kulaks. It disrupted agricultural production so badly that it caused a famine that killed 5 million people after the bad harvest of 1933 and 1934. The second five-year plan from 1933 to 37 was originally intended to produce consumer goods, but fear of the Nazi regime in Germany prompted Stalin to shift the emphasis to heavy industries and weapons production. Consumer goods became scarce and food was rationed. Stalin's policies of industrialization and collectivization could only be carried out by threats and by force. To prevent any possible resistance or rebellion, Stalin used the NKVD, the secret police, to create a climate of terror that extended from the intellectuals and the upper levels of the party all the way down to ordinary Soviet citizens. Many Soviet citizens supported Stalin's regime in spite of the fear and hardships. Stalinism created new opportunities for women to join the workforce and for obedient, unquestioning people to rise within the ranks of the Communist Party, the military, the government, or their own professions. But Stalin's brutal methods helped the Soviet Union to industrialize faster than any country had ever done. It cost millions of lives and suppressed basic human rights. In the late 1930s, the contrast between the economic strength of the Soviet Union and the depression troubles of the capitalist nations gave many the impression that Stalin's planned economy was actually a success. Changing gears again and looking at the Spanish Civil War. In 1931, Spanish King Alfonso XIII authorized elections to decide the government of Spain. Voters overwhelmingly chose to abolish the monarchy in favor of a liberal republic. Alfonso went into exile, and the Second Republic, initially dominated by middle-class liberals and moderate socialists, was proclaimed. During the first two years of the republic, organized labor and leftist radicals forced widespread liberal reforms, and the independent-minded region of Catalonia and the Basque provinces achieved virtual autonomy. Catalonia has had an active desire for autonomy and then total independence from Spain since 2005. The landed aristocracy, the church, and the large military clique opposed the, re the republic. And in November of 1933, conservative forces regained control of the government in the elections. 
In response, socialists launched a revolution in the mining districts of Vitorius and Catalan nationalists rebelled in Barcelona. General Franco crushed the so-called October Revolution on behalf of the conservative government. And in 1935, he was appointed army chief of staff. In February 1936, new elections brought the Popular Front, a leftist coalition, to power. And Franco, a strict monarchist, was sent to an obscure command in the Canary Islands off Africa. Fearing that the liberal government would give way to a Marxist revolution, army officers con conspired to seize power. After a period of hesitation, Franco agreed to join the military conspiracy, which was scheduled to begin in Morocco at 5 a.m. on July 18th, and then in Spain 24 hours later. The difference in time was to allow the Army of Africa time to secure Morocco before being transported to Spain's Andalusian coast by the Navy. On July 18th, Spanish garrisons rose up in revolt all across Spain. Workers and peasants fought the uprising, but in many cities, the republic governments decided, denied them weapons, and the nationalists soon gained control. In conservative regions, such as Old Castile and Navarre, the nationalists seized control with little bloodshed. But in other regions, such as the fiercely independent city of Bilbe, they didn't dare leave their garrisons. The nationalist revolt in the Spanish Navy largely failed, and warships run by committees of sailors were instrumental in securing a number of coastal cities for the Republic. Nevertheless, Franco managed to ferry his Army of Africa over from Morocco, and during the next few months, nationalist forces rapidly overran much of the Republican-controlled areas in central and northern Spain. Madrid was put under siege in November. During 1937, Franco unified the nationalist forces under the command of the Falange, Spain's fascist party, while the Republicans fell under the sway of the communists. Germany and Italy aided Franco with an abundance of planes, tanks, and arms, while the Soviet Union aided the Republican side. In addition, thousands of communists and other radicals from France, the USSR, America, and elsewhere formed the international brigades to aid the Republican cause. The most significant contribution of these foreign units was the unsuccessful defense of Madrid until the end of the war. In June of 1938, the nationalists drove to the Mediterranean Sea and cut Republican territory in two. Later in that year, Franco mounted with a major offensive against Catalonia. In January 1939, its capital, Barcelona, was captured, and soon after, the rest of Catalonia fell. With the Republican cause all but lost, its leaders attempted to negotiate a peace, but Franco refused. On March 28, 1939, the Republicans finally surrendered Madrid, bringing the Spanish War to an end. Up to five million lives were lost in this conflict, the most devastating in Spanish history. Franco subsequently served as dictator of Spain until his death in 1975. And what we see here is Guernica painted in 1937 by Pablo Picasso. It is probably Picasso's most famous work, and it's certainly the most powerful political statement he painted. He created this as an immediate reaction to the Nazis' devastating, casual bombing practice on the town of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War. Guernica shows the tragedies of war and the suffering it inflicts upon individuals, particularly innocent civilians. The work has gained a monumental status, becoming a perpetual reminder of the tragedies of war, an anti-war symbol, and an embodiment of peace. And finally, Mussolini's Italy. In post-war Italy, thousands of unemployed veterans and violent youth banded together to demand action, immediate politicians, and to serve as strong-armed men for factory and property owners Benito Mussolini became the leader of the fascist party. By 1921, the fascist party had 300,000 members. And Mussolini threatened to use them to march on Rome unless he was appointed prime minister of Italy. And the government agreed and gave in. While in power, Mussolini installed the fascist party members in all government jobs. He crushed any and all sources of opposition. Mussolini and the fascist movement excelled at propaganda and glorified war. But that being said, Mussolini's foreign policy was cautious. The Italian fascist movement was imitated by people in most European countries, Latin America, China, 
and Japan. And as we know, Mussolini would ally with German leader Adolf Hitler. We're going to stop there for today. We'll be moving on next time to topic 7.5, unresolved tensions after World War I. Cheers, y'all.